All right, you know, it, I clicked it, and it, it took a little extra push to get that going. Well, Robert, it's just it's just like I'm having a deja vu all over again. Deja vu, okay. <laughs> Radio Charles News. Okay. Well, the good thing is we, we, we've driven off the other patrons from the uh, lounge here, so we're, that's good, too. Oh, good. <laughs> no. I, I like the to share. The <laughs> share of the science. Yes. Oh, wow. All right, I hear the... I'm waiting for the Maraca players. The Maracas players of Matewan. Here they go, listen. That was just Nicely done. gorgeous. And I just make that little reference to the maracas, the people playing maracas. Uh, among the many things, that, and before we, we'll jump in and I'll let you introduce the show officially, Radio sure. Science News, from down, way down in what we call uh, the West Virginia coal fields, down, you know, the area of Logan County and Matewan mm -hmm. and all that. And we actually, uh, you wouldn't think, Robert, but that there would be a fine, delicious Mexican restaurant in Matewan, West Virginia. But well, there, but hmm, there you go. Another good reason to go. It's another good. All right, let me let before I digress too far. Go ahead and, uh, and introduce today's radio science news show, and I'll Certainly. I'll re hey, I'll relax uh, here for a second. Sure. Um, I am here in beautiful downtown Wheeling, where it is of course raining. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's another beautiful rainy fall day here in uh, in in Wheeling. Uh, this is October thirtieth. 2021 you're listening to radio science news episode number 810 oh, in a series nice. uh if you folks are prime number fans you'll remember that you tuned in last week uh there was a prime number at 809 and next week at 811 those are twin primes but today is sadly not a prime oh. the factors are two and three 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 and five wow that that's I know that's, lots of factors. It is there are factors, and you know, and as I, I was, I was talking to you guys earlier about this this beautiful area We're close to Logan, West Virginia. This is Chief Logan State Park, yes. and as I am to find out, uh, you know, in my early uh, childhood education, when they explained to me that West Virginia really didn't have any, as they said, Indians at the time or Native Americans. I, I I'm always fine. I'm always surprised to find out that I'm in parts of states where there were tribes and uh, villages and Indian chiefs and uh, rivers named after the the tribes. And we're here. We're close to the Guyandot River, and right. uh, and uh, Chief Logan uh, was a very prominent historical figure, even mentioned by Thomas Jefferson. If uh, if you are a, an aficionado of interesting history stuff. Uh, what happened with Chief Logan was quite an amazing thing. So uh, that's just a side issue. But but you know what? We need to jump in. I have so much stuff here, Robert, that we I'm didn't sure. we didn't get to from last week. I I was able actually just to shovel some of it from last week over to this week. <laughs> and, so, uh, uh, so so you've been so so you've been doing the the science shovel. The shovel huh? shovel. You know, some people say that guy can really shovel it. Is what they've he said. He can really <laughs> shovel some science. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Okay. Now the other thing, the other thing I was so uh, if if folks are on radioscience.news.org, org, that's where we have the launch pad of science. Yes. Uh, and uh, I'm going to jump right to it immediately because uh, last week when I told you that I had put up, uh, we're actually going to look at last week. So last week's thing about the direct carbon fuel cell, and then I had with nickel. Yes. I want you to click that up again because I realize I actually had the right place. I think I did with anyway. With nickel, okay. I'm looking. I don't. Oh, oh, yeah. So, 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 so you're doing. So, so on the on the you see launch the, pad of science, yeah. which you can get to from www.radiosciencenews.org. Right. Uh, back last week, October 23rd, I will click on with nickel. Now I'm going to hope you get the same thing I got because sometimes, All right. uh, of course, I'm using the uh, the very rare uh, browser Sea Monkey, and you're probably using something more reasonable. But, but uh, probably, but, now, but I like that one. I like see making. Now I'm opening up on a really nice image of a schematic drawing of Brown University direct Ooh. carbon fuel cell. Or is that where yep, you are too? There's an anode and there's a cathode. There you go. With a nickel mesh yeah. that is holding activated carbon particles. 
Yeah, and well, right. and the thing that uh, so I'm looking at. The, what I had, what I had noticed when we first looked at this, because we've been talking a lot about the fact that nickel is one of those. Uh, it's on that row of the periodic table that just happens to have very special properties for for doing some uh, some kind of new energy things. Right. It, and, and well, you, it, uh, it, it, it 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 turns out that that iron, nickel, and zinc, which are all in that same uh, area, it turns out that if you're a star. And I know that you are, mm. but but uh, but 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 we're talking about the the shining stars in the sky. It turns out that that where the break even point for for a, 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 a fusion and fi- fi- a, fi- a, fi- a fission is right around the iron and nickel place. Yeah, and so that makes these that 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 makes the the. The, the the protons and the neutrons in the 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 a a new a new a new a nuclei it makes them very easy to switch back and forth yep yes i've been doing my 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 little research trying to figure out why this um this low energy nuclear reactions happening and i keep thinking nickel 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 and gotta go oh well that's that's where essentially the the last fusion reactions in stars happen around the okay. iron and the the nickel stage yeah and there's just this whole i guess they're called the alkali metals that one that you yeah. know we have uh you know all uh, anyway there are a bunch of tungsten and you know all the palladium all these things that that were first tried for uh, as the so-called uh, cold fusion back when fleshman ponds anyway i just wanted to look at that again because i think this is important we'll maybe in the very near future be able to come look back at this and explain why it was but you see how simple this is robert the it's extremely simple direct carbon fuel cell now the reason why yep. i i wanted to bounce back to that okay i'm going to go back to the launch pad of science all right and i'm going to get back to uh this week's now uh you'll notice that i start with route 44 <laughs> and so before yeah. before we get to Route 44, I, I, I'm just going to say that uh, I, this area is really very interesting, and we've had a wonderful time talking to so many friendly people. We we ended up at uh, Wand, Miss Wanda's Diner down in Williamson, Williamson, West Virginia, because we were on our way to Mate Wan, and Mate Wan is has a lot of history as far as the coal fields, the beginning of the union movement, and it, just there's so much to talk about. But uh, as often happens, Robert, uh, my wife and I ended up in Miss Wanda's restaurant. We wanted to go a little bit after the lunch hour because we we were like at, a, at an antique store and they said, well, Miss Wanda, if, if it's too busy, she can be cranky, so <laughs> go. And she was as nice as could be. And there was only one other couple in the little restaurant. So social distancing was no problem, right? Except that we immediately uh, started striking up conversations with the people at the next table because they said, hey, where are you from? And we said, we're from Wheeling. And uh, long story short, this gentleman was a, he had retired from uh, Allegheny Power, uh, the division that was Kentucky Power. You know, if you're in Matewan or this area, you're right across the river from the border. So we had long discussions. I'm not going to tell you the, you know, our wives, the wives had to drag us apart at the end of dinner because, <laughs> because he was, he was, a, you know, a guy who had started as a coal miner, an electrician in the coal mines. Then he got, uh, you know, his, in, became an electrical engineer and started working for AEP. And so he, he'd retired and we just kind of started talking about all the things. And if, one of the first things he said to me was he, we talked about the solar and we talked about, uh, yeah, the, the the big, the huge wind power turbines. And, and so a long story short was that he's not a huge fan of the big wind turbines because they are, he says it take, it's like a 20 year period before they can start making money because they're so huge and they're so expensive and it's got to okay. be, it's a big deal. It's not like you can just do it. So now solar, we were, we were talking about using the old coal fields or the strip mines for solar. And he, you know, he, he said, well, yeah, now these are all good things. Uh, he was kind of getting into the idea that we should use all sorts of things, and I, I kind of mentioned, what a great idea. I kind of mentioned, uh, well, you know, it, 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 after some of the discussions, he said, you know, what I'm really a big fan of is hydrogen, because he said hydrogen fuel cells and things like this are the way to go, and then I, and I said, well, are you familiar with carbon fuel cells? He says, oh yeah, yeah, and we started talking about direct carbon fuel cells and wow. all this, and, and anyway, the the long story short is that uh, he. 
he was kind of saying, well, you know, why don't we, we should try to just use all of them. And I, and I said, well, I kind of agree if we sort of put them on an equal playing field. Like, for example, uh, he explained to me that one of the, the big issues in Kentucky was they had these big two big coal-fired power plants, and initially it was, looked like they, they were going to put scrubbers on one and maybe shut the other one down. But he said what happened before too long was they realized that they would just shut down one of them completely, and instead of putting the scrubbers at a huge expense, they would just retool it for natural gas. He says that's the way it works. Wow. It's like the Brilliant. market. He said that's the market. Yeah. So we were able to talk about all that. So uh, oh. I'll tell you what I'm going to I'm going to jump to the second story because the, the issue that we that we were kind of both a little unclear on was well, who's getting all the subsidies? You know, because right. the, the point was well, let let's let everything be out there, and, and as he said. Natural gas outcompeted the, the the coal because of all the issues of having to either clean up or scrub, you know, scrub the the process. So I'm going to click on to subsidies because this right. is this is a brand new story just I think from literally yesterday or the uh, I was listening to to one of the public radio stations here as we were driving around and uh, they were talking about the fact that this week Congress brought up all the uh, they had the big companies like Exxon and everybody before the Senate uh, Senate committee talking about the, the big issue again is that of course Exxon knew about uh, climate change issues years ago and like the tobacco companies they pretended they didn't. Do you remember that sort of thing? Yeah, I sure do. Uh, okay, okay. So mine's loading up and I've got to get rid of some. I, I seem to have some uh, ads popping up that I don't want to. I know. I just wish they'd get out of my way. I'm afraid if I click so anything. Says, so, so, so this is this is from a a, 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 a little newspaper called the a Washington Post. I, I think, think I've heard of those guys. I think I have too. It says a Biden bill targets fossil fuel firms in hopes of raising more than one hundred billion dollars <laughs> in taxes. Well, that's pretty good. That's a lot of taxes. That's. Uh, that's 10 to the 11th power in dollars. Well, that's a lot of dollars. I'll take now. It actually says we can listen to the article, but I'm I'm thinking maybe we'll just skim through it because we don't, you know, I don't okay. want to take up. A, it's a it's a it says it's a nice four minute listen, and uh, mm -hmm. that's nice that Washington Post has done that. But but it I certainly is nice. Uh, it, it says the the, the tax. Uh, the nice thing about that is that you could be 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 driving your 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 car and you can listen to it and. And, and 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 still keep your hands close to the to the yeah. wheel uh, if if uh, if a robot is uh, is driving, that's a great idea. So one of the things that people are arguing about, uh, and even as we live in a you know in many ways a primarily coal state you know industry uh, here in West Virginia, <clears throat> there's a lot of discussion. Uh, well, how do we pay for this? And you know what do we? And, and the thing I am finding is that a lot of people are just so opposed to subsidizing like solar and you know, and I'm thinking, well, but what's the real issue? The, the you know the Exxon's yeah. and all this. Uh, so there, it says here the in, what they're looking at is changing some of the uh, the big loopholes for all the fossil fuel industry fossil fuel industry by closing. It says the revenue would come primarily from closing one tax loophole regarding overseas income and reinstating uh, EPA agency Superfund cleanup tax that just hit, for some reason it it lapsed on big oil in the 1990s. Huh, I wonder why. <laughs> I just don't know. Uh, anyway, <laughs> th th this is again kind of a long article and it, it's about the reconciliation bill and uh, tax credits and uh, it says the American Petroleum Institute said that these fees are duplicative uh, and punitive. Those are both big words, Robert. Aww. Now, they didn't say duplicitous, but they said duplicative, meaning like we're piling on or something. Yeah. Uh, and then it goes down. This is a pretty good, this is a pretty good summation. The burning of fossil fuels, uh, coal, oil, and gas is, is a primary source of carbon dioxide emissions and contributor to global warming. And this past week, if someone were to want to get into it even deeper, it says the House lawmakers spent six hours grilling top leaders of ExxonMobil, BP, Chevron, and Shell Oil on their alleged role in misleading the public. Now, if they were if they were grilling them, I hope they just used some charcoal from the Kingsford plant uh, local here. So. Yeah. And and, uh, <clears throat> and 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 I noticed what they were grilled on. 
they were grilled on their alleged role in misleading the public exactly. on climate change. Yeah. Now, why, why would they do that? Well, I, there must be some money in it somewhere. That's all I can say. I guess. Wow, this is interesting. So it says, while Congress is chastising the executives, governments around the world are providing. This, we're talking about the petroleum industry, and and yep. one of the one of the things that the petroleum industry, the big five, were saying was that that if you, if you just go after them, that's making it unfair because they have to compete with all those little companies. <laughs> I thought so. so 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 wait oh, wait a second. Check out um, this next paragraph when you so, get. So so you're telling me that the governments around the world are providing the oil, natural gas, and coal industry with hundreds of billions of dollars in annual check out the next sentence why so so why are the gasoline prices going up yeah that's well that's the big thing because i just spent hundreds of billions of dollars to keep them operating why are they charging us more? Well, and here I want to point out to you that you just I don't understand. Just below the sentence that you were referring to, it says that between 2015, I, I think that was somebody got elected in 2000. I'm not sure. And 2019, it says the top 20 economies in the world provided 3.3 trillion dollars of direct support to coal, oil, and gas. Wow. That seems that seems I a little unsided. That, too, that and seems. I was thinking, that can't possibly be well, true. There you go. <laughs> anyway, I, this is this is this is a long article. It explains a lot. I was going to kind of scan to the bottom and see. Uh, there's a you're talking about a meth, methanol or a provision for uh, methane. You know, the thing is the by limiting the the pouring of methane in, out into the atmosphere, they said it might cause the, the TVs were saying that it might cause the gas natural gas prices to jump over the winter and you're going eh. there is a long there was a long story short analysis here that basically said that removing the subsidies uh, it, it, there was another actually I almost put up a, the Fox News article because it actually explained that uh, studies had shown that if you eliminated their uh, their subsidies it would make very little difference because the first, the, just this year, the first quarter profits have been a record profit, and they have raised the price of gas. We saw the price of gas go up understand. 15 cents yesterday here in the Logan area. So Yeah. Hey, um, I, because uh, I enjoy, enjoy uh, d doing the math, I just took $3.3 3 yes. and divided it by the number of seconds in four years. <laughs> All right? Yeah. And it turns out that that the oil, coal, and natural gas industries were being subsidized during that four-year period at a rate of $26,143.23 a second <laughs> oh my gosh. for four years. Hey, that's... That, is, that is a reasonably good yeah. salary in the United States. Per second, oh my gosh. Per second for four years we dumped into coal, coal, oil, and natural gas, and then they have the freaking nerve to charge us extra for our oil and our gas. Oh my gosh! Well, I, I don't understand. Well, it, you know, nobody down Those here. Those are not nice, good people. Well, I. I, could've... I mean, if somebody handed me three point three trillion dollars over four years, I think I would be doing really neat things for them. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Gee. Well, anyway, so that's like, that's. Uh, hey, hey. Yeah. Uh, my 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 wonderful wife just came over and she rubbed my back and said, "Calm down." <laughs> There's a surprise. No way. No way. I'm not going down. I'm gonna. We're gonna have to. We're gonna have to send you to the Bernie Sanders clinic. You know, get where he. You know, Bernie and you guys could. Uh, no, no. I I consider it. I consider it youthful energy. How's that? I just, I mean, that's a lot of money. Yeah. You know, the, uh, um, um, d d d didn't, didn't we just have some, some big deal about in, 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 in the Senate and the Congress, they, they wanted $3.5 trillion to do all this fantastic, wonderful and stuff. They, and and you they can't find it. Yeah. <laughs> and then they trimmed it down. Well, this is essentially the same amount of money that we dumped onto these people. Right, well, and we're getting what 
higher higher gas, gas prices. prices it just goes to Come show on. you <laughs> just all right so i'll tell you what just to cheer you up i'm going to take you to route 44 let's go to route 44 where i where on route 44 because it's close to the hatfield and mccoy the Hat, hatfields and the mccoy uh i guess it's like uh it's like four wheeler there's a whole park where they have hundreds of miles of of like oh, yeah. off-road stuff and it's actually i'm going to say it's been kind of interesting how it's uh, talking to people in the area and how it's worked out. Uh, uh, but the, I actually found gas for $2.94 a gallon, Robert, which I was shocked at. It, it was, And where it happened to be was it w- a place called, it was the Jerry West Highway. Now, Robert, I know, you, I know you're a big basketball fan, so you know that Jerry yeah. West was a... <laughs> Uh, anyway, so even if you're not, I you would not have known, or you might have known, that Jerry West, uh, his his jersey number was 44. So it says West Virginia uh, Route 44 is a north uh, north south state highway in Logan County. Now, oh, there, that is funny. Well, and and uh, it, and it's uh, one mile south of Mountain View. Now on this page, I have the Wikipedia page for West Virginia Route 44. And yeah. and there was there's so much I could talk about, but if you were to look in the right hand corner there, do you see the view north? Yeah. The view north along uh, W uh, West Virginia 44 at US 52 near Mountain View. Now, if you click on that, uh, first of all, it, what you're going to see is what I have found to be one of the most amazing things throughout this whole area. It's just a beautiful. You know, mostly it's like hollows and rivers and streams, and, and for the most part, you you know, there are coal mines still working, uh, but they're they're deep mining, you know, no strip mining. Uh, but the right. highway system, it, so what you're going to see, you're going to see uh, North 44, and everywhere around it are these real deep cuts. If oh, you're yes. a geology fan, uh, and if the cut you're looking at right now, if you're looking at this picture. Uh, mm-hmm. Uh, if you'll you'll notice there, at the bottom there's a dark there's actually like a maybe a one foot seam of coal and then oh, further coal, up yeah. further up there's a, a bigger seam and then even further up and in between it are millions of years of geologic sedimentation yeah. uh, just a gorgeous thing and I, I I found also interesting on this particular page if you go to the right eh, I'm trying to get my thing to there's a place where you can get more oh, if you click on it you can get a, get a close up so you can really see. And yeah. uh, uh, all of the all of the, the the really wonderful highway systems and things going through this part of the country, which allow you to see just gorgeous uh, forests, and if the fall colors here are just magnificent, uh, but what you're seeing are just a, amazing landscapes and uh, topography that just looks like it should be in a you know you're thinking it's almost like a science fiction movie where you've gone yeah. to another planet. But it, I agree. A beautiful it's part beautiful. of the state. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, uh, the 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 couple of times that that uh, that that Libby and I have been been down in that part of the state, it's just beautiful. So beautiful. It, and it's uh, and it, I'm, I'm going to say it's it's underutilized, and I say that in the sense that the entire history of this area, for the most part, has to do with the fact that at some point they they figured out there was coal here. And yes. maybe the first big industry that they had was they would use the coal to boil off the, the salt waters. To, and then they were like, one thing they were talking about how they were shipping salt to Wheeling. That was one of their big things. Because they have the Tug Fork River here. Uh, the river system allowed you know some transportation. But when the railroads finally started cutting through here, that just opened things up. And you, you could be mm-hmm. in Little Mate Juan, which has a lot of historic value, you could get on a train there and you could go to Cleveland and it was it was an it's almost just a whole different world and I think that as they look to the future for this region the idea that that those routes are already there and you know the transportation uh, some of it's becoming wonderful highways uh, large areas that are just rough country are, are it's the huge industry of having off-road vehicles that you know it's kind of it's kind of controlled and safe and there are hotels and things popping up and and beds and back bed and breakfast kind of situations a lot of interesting stuff that uh you know you you might i'm not a big four-wheeler fan i i think it's a 
you know, I get a little worried because in our neck of the woods, people get injured a lot and, you know, they're running them up and down places that are not safe. Uh, here, right. here, the routes are often that the, the Jerry West Highway, which is just a beautifully, you know, resurfaced area that we drove on. It was and it was like it was arrows straight through the through the tops of all these mountains. And it was just gorgeous. Uh, it, right next to it, they had the, uh, you know, the, the unpaved the the off track things but it was you, we saw just big groups of uh, you know young people from Pennsylvania and Ohio and everywhere just uh, having a good time and it looked looked fairly you know looked fairly safe I you know I'm not going to judge it at all so anyway lots of good stuff here but I think it's time to go off planet Robert if that's okay with you off planet I want to visit the baby planet baby planet the astro they dis the astronomers discovered this little baby planet. And uh, infant, they're they're calling it an infant planet. I know, and I'm That's looking at it. Cool. I'm looking at it, and it almost looked like a Christmas ornament. I'm not going to draw. I'm not going to say anything about that. But uh, I think we touched on this a little bit last week. But I just uh, I, I, the thing that I noted as I, I was looking through this article again was this. So much of this is being done by uh, the astronomers at the the facilities in Hawaii, mm -hmm. the, the University of Hawaii at Manoa facility. And as we talked about, our good friend Ted Bradston would have probably been in on this. I was excited because uh, they're using the Subaru telescope ah, yes. <laughs> on Mauna Kea. And I have, a, I have a Subaru that I'm driving, but, you know, mine didn't come with a telescope. And I'm, oh, I'm, a, little, I'm a little bit upset. And also the Keck Observatory <laughs> on Mauna Kea. Uh, anyway, this is, a, this is a cool little article. Uh, and it, down in, near the middle, I thought there was something that we, you, you and I have talked about. It says two of the world's largest telescopes uh, use adaptive optics technology. Yes. And, of course, Mauna Kea's clear skies uh, were all they needed to make the discovery. The thing that is so cool about this little baby planet is that it's actually visible. You know, it's visible light kind of thing. It's not one of the complicated, uh, you know, transit discoveries and all that stuff. So. Right. Uh, so this yeah, is so, really cool. So, so, so they're calling this, and, and, and I'm sure that that a, a better name will come around. Two M zero four three seven B. Yeah. Um, which, which I'm, 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 I'm sure the the star about which it goes around is probably two M zero three four seven. Um, Fair enough. <laughs> I, I noticed that even though that that this is a baby, uh, a, 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 a planet. Being that it's a new planet, it says uh, researchers' estimate of the planet is a few times more massive than Jupiter. Yeah, I saw that's what I was. That's that was interesting to me too. And what's really cool about that is that if you were to take all all of the other planets in the solar system, you know, Saturn, Earth, Uranus, Neptune, Mars, Mercury, Venus, on and on, and on all of the moons, all of the asteroids, all of the comets. They don't make half of that mass. Yeah. So, so, so Jupiter is 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 over is 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 over twice as massive as all the other objects in the solar system except the sun. And this planet is so big, it's a few times more massive than that. Yeah. Yeah. That is cool. Very cool stuff. And uh, the, the other thing I thought was neat, it says that uh, soon when they launch the Jam when the uh, James Webb Space Telescope is launched, that part of the, they're saying they could identify gases in the atmosphere of this protoplanet and reveal wow. or reveal whether the planet has a moon-forming disk already. So I'm that telling you, so cool. these guys have got some good scopes. Good for you, folks. All right, quick look at the moon rocks. All righty. It says here, let me see. Uh, oh, this is the Chinese. This is talking about the Chinese uh, probe. The uh, uh, the Chinese are doing some interesting things. They they brought back. Uh, the, this this has changed the into the. Uh, it says the uh, lunar probe launched by the Chinese space agency recently brought back the first fresh samples. I, I always like the fresh samples myself. Mm -hmm. In and you know in more than forty years, which says something about our uh, visits to the to the near neighbor here. Uh, and it, it certainly does. It says basically they determined that uh, the, the age of these moons is 1.97 billion years, and this this is about wow. 
you know, yeah. more accurately determining that. So uh, let me look. I'm just, this is a this is a cool article, but I'm not going to cover too much of it because I felt so badly that we we missed some of our topics last week. And okay. and the next one is the Vikings. Well, and, and 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 one of the things that you and I say 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 fairly frequently yeah. is that we we don't need to go over every little teeny bit That's of right. what each of these. What you we want to do, do is just <laughs> just sort of give you a, a flavor and then let our wonderful listeners spend spend some time. That's because this we're not this isn't radio audio book. This is radio no. science news, and. Uh, you know, I, 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 I get excited about different stories, and so sometimes I'm like, oh, man, we could just spend, like, we spent so much time last week talking about the potential of solar in West Virginia, as we should. Yes. And it was appropriate. But, uh, okay, so this is cool because, Robert, this is a new definitive study about when the Vikings or how long ago they actually got here. And this is, this is cool. They used a dendrochronology. And they, it says to precisely date a UNESCO historic site in Newfoundland. And uh, the, the other thing I liked about this is I, I, I realized that uh, this great picture of the Viking hut they're showing if, on this thing, yeah. it, 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 reminds, cool? it, it reminds me of like, I think apparently they were some of the first people to build camps with A-frame camps, you know. <laughs> I, I've seen quite a few of those here. This is just really a cool structure where it's like an A-frame it's thing with gorgeous. a central entrance. But check yeah. out the date. I, I know, Robert, that uh, I, I know that you, you we've known people that's, that spend a lot of time, uh, you know, often I will, I will be not celebrating Columbus Day, but maybe Native American Day. And people that are, are so excited because in 1492, apparently Columbus and some folks from, from that part of the world made it to what is considered the New World. But I think that these guys may have been here a little earlier. Check out the date. Yeah, it says, uh, Accounting tree rings reveals that wooden objects previously found at an archaeological site on Newfoundland's northern peninsula were made from trees filled in the year 1021. Wow. That's the oldest precise date for Europeans in, in the Americas and the only one from before Christopher Columbus's voyage in 1492 there you go yeah so it so the other thing you know what the other thing is so cool is that uh at first i'm thinking oh 1021 and then i realized as they say that it says vikings they not only it says they inhabited they it's not that they visited because they built a structure exactly. and spent some time exactly 1000 years ago yeah that is just an amazing thing yeah so so as 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 i've been saying for quite some time uh the the vikings got here first yep oh uh, long 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 before the 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 spanish or the the english or the french or the the germans um if you do the math this is 471 years before yeah. that yep so, so cool. these trees were felled meaning that somebody came the, the vikings came and they chopped them down and they 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 utilize the wood wood from these huts and then then you're using the fingerprints of the of the uh the the rings on trees from other known trees and then you can can uh can 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 get a precise date that's really neat yeah. Oh, you know, just as a side, Robert, I, I even remember that on the what was that ancient show that you you, we, you and I used to complain about the uh, treasure of Oak Island or something. They oh would, yes, treasure of Oak Island. They would always be uh, using dendrochronology to try to figure out the, you know the, and and somebody told me that it's actually back on the air again. In case you wanted to you know check it out, I I, I don't think I could oh, bear to do it. Not, no. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right, that, cool. As as, uh, as as some of our radio science news people might might know that program drives me bananas <laughs> and the reason is is that either there's something there or there's not get Stop to it dragging this out yeah get to it man all right tuskless <laughs> now i think there was it's, i think this was a neil young song tuskless 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 no that's that was something else i don't know that song no it, it, it sounds a little bit like it but this is something interesting because one of one of the things i also did i, I know it's really 
I must be sharing too much of my personal life on this show, but uh, I had a good friend who was going to go to medical school, or his parents wanted him to go to medical school, and he was more of a free spirit kind of guy, and he, uh, because he was a pretty smart biology guy, he decided, uh, he went down in, in Morgantown, and he took the, they had the thing called the civil service test, Robert, you've probably heard okay. about that. So the point I is... Have. The point is, if you're going to a – most people would just think, I'm going to get a job as a postman, and so I'm going to take the civil service test. And then based on your scores, you know, you can get a civil service job with the U.S. government. Well, he was like a real outdoors, nature, camping kind of guy. And he just thought he, – he went down and took the test just sort of on a whim. And lo and behold, Robert, being a very excellent student and smart guy, he got, he got this really high score. And it was kind of like they said, well, we could – they could offer him all these jobs he could start right now if he wanted. And one of them was he could be the forest ranger for Panther State Forest in southern West Virginia. And oh, so, awesome. And so he did it. He, he took this job. And, and uh, Mary Beth and I went and visited him one time, and it was way up in the wilds of Panther State Forest. Now, his driveway you, was like driving up a, a run that, you know, that if it were flooded, you couldn't do it. But anyway... The cool, one of the cool things that he explained to me in his part of the world was that they had silent rattlesnakes. I said, what's that? He said, silent rattlesnakes. People, people had hunted. There was a thing where you could, uh, I think this area is where they would hunt rattlesnakes and then sell the, they would milk them for venom or they would kill them and eat them and they taste like chicken or something. But, but over the years, th this entire area around where he lived uh, the the dominant rattlesnake was one that had evolved, it could had only survived because it didn't rattle, or the rattle was so small that you couldn't hear it. So we actually he he said wait I hear something and and you could hear what sounded like just a little mild rattle in the leaves and it was it was one of these rattlesnakes that had did not have the structure on its tail to rattle it was just the vibration that you could hear but the only reason why they survived was nobody heard them when these people came you know, tromping through looking for rattlesnakes to either eat or sell or whatever it was they survived this story is like that because uh this is from the uh, goran gosa national park uh where it says they the the elephants that are now there bear the physical consequences of poaching's legacy so check out this yes. story and this is i mean this makes perfect sense to me and uh it sure does this has to do with uh if if, if you if you're one of those people that believes in evolution or have studied it robert i do <laughs> you you know that one of the big things that they often talk about are pressures the different yes they what they would call uh uh, you know the environmental pressures, or the the the, the things that will, in terms of evolutionary pressure, and this was this is a just a direct story of one of the most clear examples of what kind of stuff happens. That is so cool. I'm uh, let, let me just read the the, the first sentence here. It says when ivory when ivory poachers target elephants. Uh, the hunters can affect more than just the animals n num n n n numbers. In M a Mozambique, past hunting pressures led to an increase of naturally tuskless elephants in one park. That's a study finds, wow. and that makes perfect sense because you're 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 these 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 people are not um um hunting them. Or the meat, no, yeah. or the bones, they are hunting them for one thing, and that is the tusks. And if you are an elephant that doesn't have tusks for whatever reason, you're probably going to survive. Wow, and, and they even put real numbers on it. It says here that uh, uh, video and photographic records show that as elephant numbers plummeted, the proportion of tusless female Africa savanna elephants, and I guess they may be, it's maybe. Uh, whether it's uh, it's Loxodonta, I'm sure Loxo must mean no teeth yeah. or something. Africana, right. ro and look, check out these numbers. Rose from, from 18 percent to 51 percent. Wow, yeah. that's huge. That's amazing. Yeah, and then there's a nice little. Uh, there's a link that would. I'm sure it says that. Uh, there's a link that says tusklessness more advantageous from an evolutionary standpoint. Standpoint, and it probably you know it's, it's another hyperlink that takes you to more on that. 
just mm -hmm. really, it's another, uh, well, it's another amazing thing. It certainly is. All right, I'm jumping back to this one, Robert, really intrigued me. You and I are big materials. Uh, you know, we, we really like studying, you know, like material science. Sure. As opposed to immaterial science, which many people dwell on. <laughs> you know, what you yep. said was immaterial. But no, material science has some really cool surprises. This is really surprising. So I'm looking at hard wood. wood. All right. It says researchers make hardened wooden knives that slice through steak well, well this is interesting october 20th 2021 not but 10 days ago uh from the cell press sharp sharpest knives available are made of either steel or ceramic yeah both of which are human made materials that must be forged in furnaces under extreme temperatures now researchers have developed a potentially more sustainable way to make sharp knives using hardened wood <laughs> the method makes wood 23 times harder and a knife made from the material is nearly three times sharper than a stainless steel inner table knife now this is it, i mean I, it's just astonishing That's amazing. to me well i the first thing that i think of because i i i'm gonna we'll look through and see what the process is but one of the things i remember that uh you know, a lot of early uh, hunters, they didn't have to have flint to kill things because they knew no. they could fire harden wood. So they, they could process wood to make it, you know, sharp and hard. Uh, but this this thing about 23 times, it'll cut through uh, medium well steak knives easily with, with similar performance. Right. So it says that, uh, here's the part that I thought was really fascinating. Oh, and afterwards, you could, it says the hardened wood knife can be washed and reused. But here's the part that I thought was really more potentially important. Because uh, we're talking about cellulose, and, and there's some good explanation further. But it says, Lee and his team demonstrated that their, nat that their material can be used to produce wooden nails as sharp as conventional steel nails. Unlike the steel nails, the wooden nails the team developed are resistant to rusting. Okay, I'm just looking at... We've talked about uh, the, the difference of, of having maybe some kind of a composite material to replace. That's uh, astounding. Well, you know, we were thinking so, about concrete, but so, look at this. So we're looking at wooden nails that are as strong as steel nails? Well, there you are. I, and, I, and, mean, are well, be, I mean, they're, 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 they're certainly going to be, be strong, and they're certainly going to be sharp, but are they as... But are they as 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 strong as a steel nail? Yeah. Well, I think besides their strength, because they the, if if you understand the nature of of you know the wood and it goes down and goes through a big uh, if scrolling down you'll see that uh, they talk about cellulose is the main component of wood. You know. Right. But the part that's really strong is the material called lignin, which uh, of course if you're a I know Robert, you spent a lot of time studying uh, studying languages. You know that the root for lignin is stone. Right. So basically, he said, in our first step, we delignify the wood, uh, but when if you remove it, it's real soft. In the second step, they use a hot press, applying pressure, and chemically process to densify and remove all the water. And after that, it's processed and carved into the desired shape. So what we're looking at is. Uh, people spend so much time trying to find new and spiffy pro you know, plastics. But here, in this case, you've got lignin and you've got cellulose. And depending, depending on how you process it, you could just do amazing things with it. This is astounding. Well, it's, yeah. Anyway, this is just really a cool thing. And I, as I say, uh, you and I have been talking about how crazy it is to build uh, concrete structures by having... Like Portland cement and then uh, steel rebar as or you know, right. because of, for several things, this one hints at the same issue. Why would you build something that rusts away? Okay, I mean, and that's just the, the the first thing. The other thing is, if you're building something uh, of wood and you're going to use this processed, very strong wood to you know bind it to nail it together. Uh, you're not going to have the issues of, of uh, different expansion and contraction and all that no. kind of stuff. This is really, I, this one little article I just thought was so fascinating. I, I wanted to make sure we covered that. Uh, oh, the, the, one that I, wow. I, the one that I worry about not having time to cover, because there's some stories here. I have a whole section on some medical stuff, but, you know, of course, 
you know, I saw that it's about obese genes and, and C. difficile and then some other thing, uh, and, and a really cool story in a transplant. But just in case we don't have enough time, I want to jump to what I thought was the really exciting story where okay. it says LIFI. Now, you know, of course, LIFI is not a, a method of, of distributing bad information, Robert. It's L-I. <laughs> this stands for, this has to do with light. So I'm going to, so click on LIFI. We're going to, we're going to spend right. a little time on this because you are, you are very much embedded in things of the physics world. So this says controlling light with a material three atoms thick. Yeah. So here's another material science thing. I, how did I, I don't know how I managed to get that in here, but... So here's a little a cool picture. Now, when you first look at the picture, you'll right. s this is an artist's rendering, and w basically what they're showing is that this is a material that will reflect light. Right. And this is the artist's rendering of light bouncing off a surface of what they're calling black phosphorus. Now, there's more to it, but now do you notice that what they're what they're showing? It shows that the light is kind of spiraling in. Do you see that? Yes, I and do it see spirals that. out, but it spirals out in a different way. So they have well, modified. So, so, so are we changing the the wa a, wa a wavelength? The, the, not only that, what they're doing is, in what they explain here, this is one of these really nice articles that, as you and I have said, you you need to take time to read this. It says here, here's the thing that's so cool. It says most of us control light all the time without thinking about it. Uh, usually in Monday, we don a pair of sunglasses, right, uh, because that changes the polarity. Or we put on sunscreen because that filters out certain frequencies. Or we just open and close things that redirect it, yada, yada. But it says, but light can also be controlled in high-tech forms. And so they, they cover some of the, you know, the things that we're all kind of familiar with. In fact, if you scan sure. way down, you'll there's a picture of like a, a calculator, uh, two and three quarters mm -hmm. plus sure. five. And, and what they're, they're basically showing is that uh, you can control the polarity to make something light or dark, and so then it can be a display. Uh, the, the article, the thing that looks, the thing that's really cool, and they, they do mention fiber optic cables. Now, now one, of the things, one of the things you and I have talked about, and I, can, I recall that we've mentioned this to young, sometimes young scientists will think that if you have a red light and a blue light and you cross the beams, you know, like the, the proverbial don't cross the beams in Star Wars, right. that somehow, you know, you're going to change the color. And it's always one of the things that we, it's a fun kind of experiment. But uh, uh, besides the fact that this material they're talking about is just, just three atoms thick and, and you can affect it, the thing that's so cool, it says it's first, you have to remember that light is a wave and right. it has a really important property known as polarization. Now, sure. if, if you if you scroll down, you're going to see a cool little chart that shows you that you know if you think about it says if you think about a boat bobbing on the ocean, the waves are just moving up and down, and that's just vertical polarization uh, because you know the the waves are passing under the boat and they're not just going up and down. They're you know they could be any angle, and and they point out that if if uh, you can. If you're riding these waves of water, you're going to go up and down. But if you were a boat that could ride light, you could be right and you could polarize it. It could be up and down, or it could be side to side, or it could be diagonal, or even a spiral. Right. So okay, so the, the, they they kind of set the they set the stage for what they're looking at doing here. Uh, and, and actually, I have another link that talks about a little bit how they do it. But it says they, they describe how they use three layers of phosphorus atoms to create a material for polarizing light that's tunable, precise, and extremely thin. And they call it so-called black phosphorus. Now, the reason why this is exciting is it's similar to one of your favorites, graphite or graphene. I was going to say it has that appearance right yeah and this is uh th it's wow. what's what's so cool is that the material you know and I, I don't i hope this isn't too complicated but they're saying it's, it has anisotro anisotropic properties it, it kind of means that it's how light is affected by you know when it bounces is angle dependent uh and what they what they're doing here let's i'm going to scroll down a little further uh did you do it, they could they could just make it do all kinds of things now okay so w w so far we've got that and that's all cool right uh but the thing that's really amazing is 
like I said, this is such a good article. They're talking about the fact that, oh, it's the liquid crystal display that you find on your little phone screen or TVs has some of the abilities, but black phosphor technology has the potential to leap far ahead of that. The so-called pixels or the resolution that you can get in manipulating right. with this black phosphorus uh, says it could be 20 times smaller than a liquid crystal display. I saw that. And then it, yet it will respond to manipulation a million times faster. Faster. So, so immediately. That's astounding. Well, the, it, the, 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 the fact that you're, that your pixels can suddenly be 20 times smaller and respond a million times faster is just amazing. Well, and it is because, and then, so so all of a sudden we're really excited because it says, said such speeds are not necessary if you're just like watching TV or reading an article. But in terms of, the first thing that they just touch upon are the, the kind of low-hanging fruit in telecom, telecommunications. So, right. you know, one of the things that people will understand, and I, and I can remember, uh, the first time I saw fiber optics being explained by somebody from the telephone company, kind of the only thing they were doing then is they were just using, you know, bright or dark, and they were, you know, sending a signal, and they were so excited because you could even multiplex because you could, you know, you could use, you didn't need, you didn't, you could send a little dark signal and a light signal, and then there was a whole empty space, and then you could do another one. And that meant that, that meant that you could do have what they called multiplexing just with light or dark. And then, of course, they understood, as the people who know that you, by crossing two different colored lights, they don't interfere with each other, you could have multiplexing stuff that was based just on colors. And, and there are some things that do that. But the, but the thing that's astonishing about this is, so forget the fact that you could have uh, discrete frequencies of light. You could have red and green, or you could have like 450 nanometers and 600 nanometers of you know light color that would send different information. So get down when you get down to this thing, what's amazing is, uh, it says, but a telecommunication device based on thin layers of black phosphorus could tune the polarization of each signal so that none interfere with each other. Wow. And of course, their, their very understated little sentence is, this would allow fiber optic cable <laughs> to carry much more data than it does now. And when they're saying much more data, they're, they're, <laughs> they're not talking like 1.1. Like, like Twice 1. as much. 2. No. They're probably talking about, oh. I don't know, may, maybe dozens or hundreds maybe thousands yeah and just based on the how, how they're able to refine their ability to control just like we were talking about spread spectrum if you could if you had something that was accurate enough to do all that okay so so now every you know I, I mean you and I are really excited about what they could do with fiber optics right so right. here's where it gets really cool Adwater says the technology could also open the door to a light-based replacement for Wi-Fi something they would call Li-Fi. So, uh, so basically what they're saying is that if you were in a, a situation, and then, now just to make it clear to all to you and I, because we spend a lot of time in Starbucks just sipping on expensive coffee. Not. No. <laughs> so here, but it's, this is so cool. It says, it says lighting like, uh, you know, you have over your desk, it doesn't carry a lot of information, right? It says, but it says, but there's no reason that you couldn't be sitting in a future Starbucks, have your laptop taking a light signal from from its wireless communication rather than a radio signal. It says it's not quite there yet, but when it does, it says that it will be at least a hundred times faster than Wi-Fi. Oh my! So uh, I, I'm just, it's just crazy, and. And they're they're prob and they're only talking about if you didn't have multiple discrete channels of information with different polarizations. Right. They're just talking about if you were able to manipulate this uh, this surface so that it reflects the. It, so it says broad. The, the the paper describing the work is titled broadband electro optic polarization with atomically thin black phosphorus. And I just, I'm just going to say, this is one of those things that the first time that you and I are seeing this, it's going to be, we're going to remember when we, first, we said, do you remember when we first read that thing about broadband electro-optic polarization? And people will go, yep. well, why don't you guys quit being so nerdy? But hey, 
I'm just, I think this is really exciting. That's really amazing. Now, and since I, I'm looking at our time, and I, I know that we, I took up a good bit on that that I think is really important. That's fine. And the reason... This is the, the, really, really amazing stuff. Well, and the reason why I was, I was, the only thing that the article left me with, you know, I was, I was hungering for more, Robert. And, and so I was, I found an article on a separate, uh, separate place that uh, the, if you click on magnetic. Okay. Gotcha. So, so this is, this is another different thing. And this is from your friends up at Fizz Org. I know that you're, you, you're always hanging out with the Fizz Org folks. I am. They're great guys. So, and they have a different title for this one. And this is an older article that it says in, investigating optical activity under an external magnetic field. Now, the first thing about that that is really intriguing, Robert, is my first thing was, hey, wait a minute, you're going to use a magnetic field to change the, the light? And I thought, this is a little, this is strange. But mm -hmm. but what it what it is actually about, and there's some, you know, complex stuff. They're talking about chiral molecules and physics and optics. But this is an older article. Like I said, the date for this is... 2020 so it's it's like it's you know at least a, a year earlier and it it has to do with uh, the quantum engineering and quantum materials uh guangdong provincial key laboratory and uh, that'd be a great place to visit so what it turns out yeah. is this is a whole separate study where this professor yin and his his fellow authors uh experimented with black phosphorus black the same stuff. First synthesized in 1914, and it's got closely, and apparently, it says, uh, in this case, in a single closely packed layer of atoms or monolayer. Monolayer, yeah. Okay, and so, and I'm assuming when they're talking about the monolayer, it's it's probably this, it's the same thing that they're talking about. But here's what these guys found out. The researchers okay. discovered that in addition to expected strong optical activity, dichroism, blah, 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 left and right, circularly polarized light, and all this other stuff, here's the part that was cool. They could they could literally tune this with a magnetic field. Yeah. So so part of what I, you know, the other people didn't really explain how they were doing everything. But uh, so, so they're using a magnetic field to actually affect the layer, and that's how they're going to do all this stuff. Yeah, that, that appears what's going on. So anyway, very cool. Here's two different stories that just kind of popped up, and, and I just thought, got to share these stories. All right, I'm looking at just this a little bit of time. Robert, I'm not sure. I'm going to give you your choice. Would you rather talk about TT10, obese genes, C. difficile, or transplant? Or would you, I you don't think, want... Go I ahead. think obese genes. That's <laughs> so all you would. That's what I'm wearing right now, as a matter of Me fact. Me too. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> oh man, How, it, it hurts. Self-deprecation is it's it's way overrated, is what I'm saying. Anyway, so say. this is actually good news. And if if you are one of the people that are you know you're down somewhere at your place shopping for this, so that it's a, a brand. It's a terrible brand. I don't think their sales are going to be very good. Obese oh, jeans. Bad name. But this is a uh, this is a really cool story from the University of Virginia Health System. And you know, Robert, well, you and I could just cross over the border here into eastern West Virginia. Uh, and the cool thing about this story, uh, in terms of medical stories, and like I said, I put these in the middle of a, a series of medical stories, is that uh, they've identified 14 genes that basically can cause and prevent weight gain. So. Yeah. This is, it, it, you know, and if you scroll down through this story, I'm going to kind of watch the time. I will start the music when it's about a minute. Now, of course, you know, what's really sad is, you know, who gets the, the first benefit is a bunch of worms. Uh, it says uh, genoma, genomicists have identified genes associated with obesity, and they're doing some of the humble worms, the famous, we've talked about these guys so much, C. elegans, the elegant little yes. worms. They like to live in rotting vegetation and enjoy feasting on microbes. And who wouldn't? Uh, but, Me too, yeah. But here's the part that's crazy is they, they actually share 70% of the genes that human we, we are in common with these little guys at that point. I'm going to get ready. Isn't I'm going to kick on. I'm going to kick on the song here as we get to the... Sure. Uh, I'm going to put it down really low because oh, we're going to be talking about obese genes. Anyway, the, the cool thing is using these wonderful little C. elegans, they have uh, they've actually screened 293 genes associated with obesity 
and uh, it says they've identified 14 and that caused it and three that prevent it. Well, there's your problem right there. 14 yeah. genes yep. that cause obesity and only three that prevent it. But anyway, this is just the opening salvo in some research about, uh, as they say, anti-obesity therapies and uh, just the knowledge of the targets for all this kind of stuff. Very, very good news for anybody out there who's... Extremely interesting. Well, and, and uh, hopeful on many levels. All right, listen, I can just well, about... Yeah. I have about like 10 seconds left to just uh, invite everybody back to Radio Science News next week and take a look at the uh, radiosciencenews.org uh, site to see when you might hear it again. Sure.